Right, so as I say, don't worry about taking notes. You have this presentation, so you can catch up with it when you want to. The aim of this session now is to understand where we are today with HIV, and especially in relation to Belgium and all the stuff that you can be doing. So even if we don't get to the end of this PowerPoint, when you look through it, you'll see the final section says, what difference can I make? And that means each and every one of you. So what difference can you make around HIV client care? Okay? If you want to tweet throughout, please feel free to tweet. And you know you've got your hashtag, um, ID2019 underscore TM. So feel free to tweet throughout. And what we're going to do then, first of all, so you know exactly how HIV goes from one person to another. So that's the modes of transmission. So how do you get it? And certainly in the UK, many people still have many myths and errors about how you acquire HIV, okay? So I'll clear that for you. So if somebody asks you afterwards, how do you get HIV? You'll know exactly how. And if you know how, then that means you'll know how to prevent it as well. Okay, that's really important. Then uh, the second thing that we look at is the impact of HIV. So if HIV gets into a person's body, what does it do? Do you know any of that? Do you know what which cells HIV goes for? Any idea? If people are talking about blood tests for HIV, do you have any idea at all? Don't worry if you haven't, I'll explain it. No? Have you heard of CD4? No? Right, okay, I'll explain all of that, don't worry. And then finally, the end bit of the presentation then, is focusing it on yourselves, seeing exactly what, what difference you can make to make people's lives better uh, living with HIV, okay? Um, but th 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 this is just a quote from an article I wrote quite recently, and it's saying that we cannot talk about HIV unless we're going to talk about sex. Now, that's a problem for some people. Certainly in the UK situation, if I've got a class of, say, 250 students, maybe over 50% will come from different parts of the world. So they come with different cultures, different religions, different practices, different ways of talking. And especially when it comes to talking about sex, so many of them may have taboos, or it may be something that, that, that they're just not allowed to talk about. So really, for me, it's a case of having to work with them from that point to get them to be able to talk about it. Because as nurses, you're doing your job for your clients, for your patients. You're there for their benefit. So if you've got difficulties talking about sex, for example, then that's your difficulty. And it's for you to work on. That shouldn't be imposed on your clients because the message you give them could save someone's life, okay? So if you do have difficulties talking about sex, and I understand that, um, as you saw, that's why I put the photograph of me as a former Catholic priest. You know, I know what it's like to come from a Catholic background in talking about sex, but it's important. This infection passes because of sex, so we must be able to talk about sex. Is that okay? All right, great. Right, so here's some of the facts now. It's really important to know that um, as far as the word AIDS con is concerned, there still is no cure, okay? There's no cure to AIDS. And there is no vaccine against HIV. Now that seems quite negative because the next slides are gonna be very, very positive. So I have to start with these facts. And back in 2013, so quite a few years ago, um, it says here that in Belgium there were quite a lot of people living with HIV. Now the situation now, in these last five years, has changed a great deal. So again, this is rather negative, things are getting better. Okay? So remember that, no cure and no vaccine. But, here's the good news. When I started working in HIV client care, we didn't even know some of these words existed. This is so, so different. And this is what's changing it right across the world for people in relation to HIV, okay? 
It's our ways to prevent, and these are all scientifically proven ways. This is how you can prevent HIV. The first way, condoms. They've always existed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and now they're getting even better. Different shapes, different sizes, different flavors, different feels to them. Condoms work, okay, so in relation to HIV. But again, when I say that, look at the first barrier. Some people may say, because of their religious beliefs, they've been told they can't use condoms. Now that's a problem then, because condoms are scientifically proven to prevent HIV infection. Okay? So that's a difficulty. And if someone says, oh no, well I can't use a condom because my faith tells me I can't, that's something they need to work on. Because supposing your client is, say, a 22-year-old, and they've just been diagnosed with HIV, and they're talking to you, and they say, look, I've got HIV. Does that mean I can never, ever, ever have sex for the rest of my life? And you say, well, yes, you can. And once you're on the medication, and I'll show you the medication, once you're on the medication, and it makes the virus go so low, it's impossible for you to infect anyone. But in the meantime, before this happens, make sure you use condoms. And then they say to you, but I can't use condoms. My faith says I can't. Well, that's where you must work with them. Okay? It's no good saying, oh, well, okay, if you won't use them, that's your business. You need to be able to work with them. Because condoms could save their lives and could save the lives of others. Okay? So that's the first proven way. The next one is this figure here, 1990, and I'll come on to that in relation to Belgium fairly soon. And that comes from part of the United Nations called the UNAIDS. So if you're on the website, it's unaids.org.org, okay? And here's the goal for the whole world. What UNAIDS wants to do is for 90% of people living with HIV to be tested so they know about it. So if in your hospitals, if they, if they test people, say in midwifery services, so that every woman coming in is offered the test, well then they could achieve 90% or more. But there are lots of services that don't test. So there are some people who don't know their status. So here's the goal. 90% of people living with HIV to be tested. If 90% of those who test HIV positive are then started on the medication immediately, and if 90% of those on medication achieve the virus going so low, it's undetectable. If those three things happen, HIV will fizzle out of our planet by about 2030. Okay? That's in 11 years' time. So there may still be the odd few infections, but to consider it a pandemic all over the world, it will be gone. Okay? But that's only if the whole world does that. <coughs> Belgium's doing really, really well. The UK is not doing too badly. But other uh, countries, especially because of cultures and sometimes religions, or beliefs and myths and errors, they're not doing so well. Okay? So the goal is to eradicate HIV as a pandemic by 2030, but if countries aren't doing this, it won't be achieved all over. Are you okay on that? Yeah? So that's really important, it's called the 1990 -90. And only a few months ago, UNAIDS added another 90 on the end, and that 90, which Belgium is really tackling well, is to reduce stigma around HIV by at least 90%. So do you understand what I mean by stigma? Stigma, yeah? So prejudice, discrimination. Say, say for example, if, if someone has type 1 diabetes, you go to your GP, and when you're waiting to see the GP, you say to the receptionist, um, I need uh, insulin, please, insulin injections. If you're sitting there in the waiting room, you're sitting there studying, and you hear someone say, I need a repeat prescription for insulin, please. You won't even look up. 
But if somebody came in and said, I need a repeat prescription for my anti-HIV drugs, please, you watch people look. And if that person's coughing, so the, the people sitting down, like, oh, please, don't sit next to me, don't sit next to me. Because they're worried, they're fearful, they're frightened, they panic. That's the stigma. So around HIV, oh, because, because most people have got HIV because of sex, and because some of them have got it because of sex that maybe in their culture or their country isn't allowed, say male-to-male -male sex, or some people have got it because of sharing needles, injecting work. Because there's stigma around those things, many people with HIV are already stigmatized before they even get the infection. Okay? So in a way, HIV is building stigma on stigma. So that must be challenged. And you're the ones that can challenge that. Okay? So the next one, does anybody recognize who that is? In the UK, they all do, okay? Prince Harry. So, once a year, on World AIDS Day, the 1st of December, Prince Harry always goes and has an HIV test. But he shows it all on television camera, so everyone can see. And loads of people think, well, if Prince Harry can do it, I can do it. So it's fantastic for encouraging this first 90. He encourages more people to be tested. It's wonderful. But the difficulty is, when Prince Harry is on telly on the 1st of December, lots of people will go for the first couple of weeks of December, but then for the rest of the year they forget about it. So a difficulty for us is, how can we keep that momentum up? Okay? How can we maintain that all year around? Two other very important factors, this one, PEP, and then PrEP. Okay? Now, PEP has been around since about the year 2000, PrEP only over these last two or three years. And what that stands for, PEP stands for post-exposure prophylaxis. So the word prophylactic, it's a Greek word, and it literally means a soldier's shield. So if the soldier is standing over the shield, that's a prevention, that's a prophylactic. Now in some languages, even the word condom is prophylactic. You go to a pharmacy and ask for a prophylactic, and you'll be given a box of condoms. So prophylactic, it's, it's a guard, it's a prevention, okay? But here, this is talking about post-exposure, so after it's happened. So in the UK, it first came out for healthcare professionals. Um, have any of you had needle stick injuries? No? You say no? Great, okay. Good. May that continue. Right. But that's, that's why PEP was first brought out. If a healthcare professional had a needle stick injury, so supposing they were taking blood from a client, and they withdraw the needle and syringe, and all of a sudden it accidentally sticks into them. And if they think blood has gone in, they might be worried in case they're going to get HIV. So what this means is they would go straight away to hospital, go to an accident emergency, and if there was a risk that the blood has come from someone with HIV, then they would be given the anti-HIV drugs. So they're the same drugs as people with HIV take, but they need to take them for 28 days. Okay? So they can take them for 28 days, so even if the virus has gone into them, it can't, can't do anything, it'll die. And I'll show you all that later. Is that okay? So that's post-exposure prophylaxis. But now it's even used in regards to sex, for example. So supposing you have a couple, and maybe one has got HIV, and the virus is still high, high viral load, and the other one has not got HIV. Okay? So if that's the situation, they might think, right, well, we will always use condoms until the viral load comes down. But supposing the condom slips, or it breaks, or it comes off, okay? So that person may then go for post-exposure prophylaxis. So then they go to hospital, and as, as soon after the first hour is important, but it could be up to 72 hours later. But it'll be more successful the earlier they go. So if they go to hospital and say, look, my partner's got HIV, viral load is still up, and we were wearing condoms, but the condom broke. They will be given post-exposure prophylaxis. 
Is that okay? Is there anything you want to say or any questions? Yes, go on. For 28 days. So start it within the first 72 hours, but as quickly to the first hour as possible. So the longer it's left, if it is 72 hours, then obviously the virus starts getting hold. So it's better, the quicker you can, the better. So the more people who know about this, that will be more effective. Yeah. Okay, so that's PEP. That's post-exposure prophylaxis. Now what's fairly new, just in these last two or three years, is PrEP. That's pre-exposure prophylaxis. So you're taking it before the event happens. So when I just gave you the example of a couple now, and if one has got HIV and the other one hasn't, we, we refer to that as a serodiscordant. So serum is blood. Yeah? So a serodiscordant couple means one is of one status and the other one is of the opposite status. If they were seroconcordant, that means they're both the same. So either both negative or both positive. Is that okay? So supposing you have um, a serodiscordant couple. Let's say it's a heterosexual couple and let's say the man's got HIV and he's only recently been diagnosed, so there's still virus showing in his bloodstream. And let's say this couple are really desperate to have a baby now. So they decide to wear condoms for the whole month. <coughs> Pardon me. They wear condoms for the whole month until it comes to the woman's most fertile days. And they say, right, are we going to take the risk now? Because there's a risk. He could pass it on to his partner, and if she then becomes HIV positive, the fetus could develop HIV. So now what's new is they can take PrEP. So they might say, right, we use condoms throughout the month, but for the woman's most fertile days, she starts taking pre-exposure prophylaxis. So she'll take a couple of tablets 24 hours before their planned sex, one tablet on each day that they have intercourse, and one tablet up to 48 hours later. And that's it, she's covered. Now this, this didn't even exist when I started nursing in HIV plant care. We didn't even know words like this. So this is all brand new. And what the World Health Organization says, supposing a person is a commercial sex worker, so they're selling sex, and supposing they're in a country where there's a high level of HIV, then that person should take PrEP constantly for as long as they're, they're, they're selling sex. So you either take it periodically, or you take it long term for as long as the risk exists. Is that okay? Yeah, great. And the final one here, and there's a typing error on there, that should say treatment as prevention, not treatment is prevention. And what that means is, if 90% of people are tested, and if they started on the medication immediately, that pushes the viral load down so low that it becomes undetectable. So that person now will live as long as they ever would have lived. They're becoming healthy, like never before could we have thought of this. Okay? So they'll live as long as they ever will have lived. But because the viral load goes so low, it's impossible for them to infect anybody else. So treatment as prevention. The, the treatment is doubling up as a prevention for passing the virus on. Are you all okay on that? Yeah? Any questions or anything you want to say? Come down and come to Yes, yes, yes. So I'll come on to that. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. So if a woman is thinking, yes, I want to become pregnant, but I know my partner's viral load is still up a little bit, then she would take a prep. So if he's diagnosed, he'll be put on the medication immediately, but it may take a few weeks for the viral load to come down. And if this, we can't wait for it to come down, we want to get pregnant now, then if he's still got a bit of a viral load, there is still a chance he could pass that on. And if she becomes HIV positive, then the, the fetus will as well, at that stage. And I'll show you why in a bit. Is that okay? Yeah? Great.
Are you all okay on this? Now I showed you those two words, HIV and AIDS, but what do they stand for? Do you know it in English? Virus. Yeah. And yeah. So the human yeah. immunodeficiency virus. And AIDS is um, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Lovely. So the acquired. So somehow you've got it. Okay. Because there is something called congenital immunodeficiency syndrome, but that's nothing to do with this. <laughs> nothing at all. <coughs> so it's the acquired. Somehow you've you've got it. Okay. And it's a syndrome because it's a collection of illnesses. It's not like saying, supposing you go to work on um, a chest cancer ward, people have got lung cancer. Everyone will have the same signs and symptoms. So they might be losing weight. Maybe they've got a nasty cough. No, mine isn't that. Um, they might have a nasty cough, but maybe they bring up blood. But everyone will have the same signs and symptoms. With, with AIDS, Acquired immune deficiency syndrome, it's a collection of illnesses. So one person may have a lung disease, another one may have a brain disease, somebody else may have horrendous diarrhea that's making them go so slim that when this was first um, uh, discovered, lots of people used to call it the slimness disease in certain nations because they thought this person's gone so, so slim. It's not that they were malnourished, they had food, they could eat and drink, they weren't malnourished, but the food would go into them and come straight out as diarrhea. Okay? So they were becoming very, very slim. So it's a syndrome, it's a collection. Alright? Are you all okay? Yeah? Right, now from the point of view of Belgium, look, you're doing really well, fantastically well on those two. Just a little bit more to do here. So, there's about 10.9% of people living with HIV who still do not know it. Now, in, in many European nations, there are certain groups of people that have had higher levels of HIV. So, for example, um, gay and bisexual males, injecting drug users, in certain parts of Northern Europe. So if you go into any gay bar, There'll be big signs up. Make sure you get HIV tested. Use condoms when you have intercourse. So there's lots of awareness of this happening. But there are lots of people who don't even think they're at risk. Okay? And can you imagine who might who might not think they're at risk? Any ideas? Well, one of the biggest groups are heterosexual people. Because lots of heterosexuals, because in the early days of HIV, because, it, because people thought it was certain risk groups that got it, then the heterosexuals would say, but I'm not in that group, so I'm not at risk. So when lots of young people go away on holidays, and they go to places where there's lots of, lots of uh, uh, music, recreation, and maybe even lots of sex happening, and if they're heterosexual, they might think, I'm not going to get HIV because I'm not in one of those risk groups. Now that's the trouble with talking about high risk groups. It means that people are ignorant of this. But also in some cultures, in some cultures for example, um, and some religions, a woman can't even go to a medical doctor without her husband's permission. And if she thinks, well look, when I got married to my husband, I was a virgin. So if I've got HIV now, it's only my husband that could have given this to me. But how would I have that conversation with him? So that's why she might decide not to be tested. So even if she's having a baby and she goes to midwifery services, a big sign may say, we test everyone for HIV unless you tell us not to. Okay? That's called opt out. So she might opt out because she doesn't want to know her status. Now, what you have to ask yourselves, here in Belgium, who are these 10.9 people? And how can you raise the awareness of HIV more that it might encourage people to go? And it could be a case that once you know the different AIDS-related illnesses, you might think, right, anyone that has one of these illnesses, we must always think of testing. So tuberculosis is one. 
If someone's got tuberculosis, and sometimes in some countries, it may be homeless people who, who are malnourished, not, not, not living healthy lives because they can't, and they're far more vulnerable to tuberculosis. So if somebody with TB presents to you, you should always think, we need to do an HIV test as well. Okay? Because tuberculosis is one of those AIDS-related illnesses. So if two people came into the room now, and if, if two people came in and said, look, we've both got TB, we've both got tuberculosis, and if one of them says, well, I've got tuberculosis, but that's my only illness, then they've only got tuberculosis. If the other person says, well, I've got tuberculosis and I've got HIV, then the day they were given the tuberculosis diagnosis is the day they're giving an AIDS-defining illness. That's the day that they say, you've got an AIDS illness now. Okay, because TB is one of those illnesses. Is that making sense? So, yeah. okay. so you're telling that uh, people um, getting diagnosed for, for, for the TBC are uh, better equally checked for HIV. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, definitely. Because, so there's a, I'll come on to this later, there's about 23 different illnesses that all around the world, health departments agree, these are what we call AIDS defining illnesses. So when a person gets one of these, they've got AIDS. But it's better to, don't say they've got AIDS, it's better to say they've got an AIDS defining illness. And one of those is tuberculosis. So because tuberculosis and TB goes hand in hand, it's always worth doing this as a check. Yeah, is that okay? Yeah, great. Okay, so look, congratulations Belgium, you're doing really, really well. But in your strategy it says, that's no reason just to sit back on your laurels. You've got more to do, okay? So please keep on. And from your strategic plan, these are four key issues. So one of them is HIV prevention. Now I've just shown you all those wonderful ways of prevention. So thinking of 1990-90, increasing testing, thinking of post-exposure prophylaxis, pre-exposure prophylaxis, okay? So HIV prevention. Also, getting more people to be tested, and the minute they're tested, if it comes back positive, they started on treatment immediately. So the moment they started on the treatment, it means that the virus is going to start going down in their bloodstream. So they will then lead healthier lives, live healthier lives, and it means the virus can't be passed on. Okay? The next one is, if people are living with HIV, and supposing they've got illnesses, so maybe they have an age-related illness, so what type of care will they now need? Now it could be, supposing they have um, uh, cancer related to HIV. So one of the cancers is cervical cancer in women. So how often do women have to go for cervical screening here? Every five years, is it? Okay. So in the UK, so it starts at the age of 25. From 25 onwards, all women get called up to go for the cervical screening. And it's, um, it's once every three years. But if a woman's living with HIV, she'd be called up once every year. Because um, cervical cancer is an AIDS-defining illness in a person living with HIV. So again, if we had two women now, um, both with cervical cancer, if one said, well, I've got cervical cancer, that's my only illness, that's what she's got. But if the other one says, I've got cervical cancer and I'm HIV positive, then she has an AIDS-defining illness. Okay? So it's just a label that, right, if you've got HIV and if you've got one of these 20 odd illnesses, that's called an AIDS defining illness. Is that okay? Yeah? Great. And the final bit of this, within the quality of life, it's really um, looking at challenging stigma and discrimination. So, supposing you, you're working with patients, you're working with clients, and one of them comes in and tells you that they've got HIV. 
And if another healthcare professional says, oh, that person's got HIV, let's put them in a little room of, the, of their own, and there's no other reason for it, that's prejudice, that's stigma, and that must be challenged. Okay? Or if someone says, oh, that person's got HIV, so if I take gloves, instead of putting one pair of gloves on, I'm going to put two pairs of gloves on, just to be extra safe. That's stigma. That's prejudice. In fact, it's also putting yourself at risk. Because you know how difficult it is taking blood with one pair of gloves on. If you put two on, you might not even feel the needle terribly well. So there's more chance you could stick yourself and have an accident. But it's prejudice, it's discrimination. So that really is essential that you challenge this. Yeah, is that okay? Right. Now, here's a message, and for those of you on Twitter, it'll be hashtag you, then write the word equals you. You equals you. And this is brand new terminology. Nobody knew of this until a year or so ago. This stands for undetectable equals uninfectious. Okay? So once the virus is in the person's body, when they're newly infected, it may go up to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies of the virus in every little drop of blood. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands. But once you can reduce them so low that they can't even be spotted, that's when they are undetectable. And if a person says to you, I'm undetectable, that means it's impossible for them to pass on HIV. Okay, so during sex, they may think, well, they might even go without condoms, but that's another story, because you have to think of other sexual infections as well. But from the point of view of HIV, they're no longer infectious, if you equals you. And that also relates to healthcare professionals as well. Because up until all of this happened, it meant if a healthcare professional was living with HIV, they couldn't do what was called exposure prone procedures. So are any of you midwives? Midwifery students? Yes, yeah, okay. So midwives, for example, once a woman is given birth, and suppose that she has an episiotomy, yeah, or she tears. So you have to put your fingers inside her vagina to sew up. That means you cannot see your fingers. So that's an exposure-prone procedure. Because if your fingers are inside someone else and you're sewing up, if you prick yourself with a needle, you bleed inside them. Or if you're a surgeon and your hands are inside a person's body, or if you're a paramedic and you're called out to a road accident and you put your hands in to touch somebody and you cut yourself on broken glass and you're bleeding and then your hands go inside their body cavities. So healthcare professionals could not do this. But now, because of this medication, they can. If a healthcare professional says, well, I'm living with HIV and they're on the medication, once they reach this, they are no longer infectious. So they can carry on doing whatever their job was. Okay? Great. <coughs> now, here's that 1990 again, and I just want to show you what's happening over the world. So it says here that there are almost 37 million people living with HIV, but only 75% know their status. That means 25% of people living with HIV do not know. That's about 9 million people. So if those 9 million people now go out and have unprotected intercourse, condomless sex with somebody, there's a chance they're going to pass the virus on. That's 9 million. So the quicker we get to 1990, the quicker this 9 million will be detected. Okay? And it says here, um, three out of five people living with HIV are on antiretrovirals, the anti-HIV drugs. Three out of five. That means two out of five are not on them. Okay? So they are still a risk to themselves and to others. And finally, only 47% have undetectable viral loads. That's less than half. So for every two people around the world, at least one still has a viral load which can be detected. 
And that means it's attacking their body so they could become ill over time, but also it means they are infectious to other people. Yeah, anything you want to say? Right, um, do you know who she is? Lots of you do, some don't, okay. So Princess Diana, look, she, she challenged stigma so beautifully because she opened a couple of HIV wards and I've written some stories about them here. She opened an HIV ward. Look what's on that man's legs. That's called Kaposi sarcoma. It's a particular type of cancer, so it's an age-related cancer. And he had that, and Diana is sitting right there, and she's touching him. She's right next to him. In fact, I was on that ward the day that photograph was taken, when she opened that ward. That's why I've written these stories here. And who's this? Okay, right. So your own queen supporting this. It's really important for high-powered people. <coughs> <On me. coughs> I'm just getting over bronchitis. Um, it's really important for high-powered people, especially um, royalty, politicians, famous people, to champion the cause of HIV, because due to the stigma, lots of society want to step away from it. So the very fact that your royalty is seen doing something, I would say is a very, very positive sign here. Okay, I'm gonna flash through these, uh, have a look at the municipal power plants. This is showing across the West, Western and Central Europe area um, the numbers of people who are most at risk of HIV. Okay? And in Belgium, uh, you've got a clear downward trend. Please have a look at these uh, when, when we're offline. I haven't got time to stop at it really. But look, each new HIV diagnosis is one too many. So think back to those prevention strategies. If it was condoms, PEP, PrEP, early testing, all of these will help. And for everyone that adopts those, it's reducing the levels of HIV. Now, I just wanted to flash this image up because in the uh, 1980s and 1990s, when, when AIDS was first diagnosed, the images were always about death. It was death, illness, disease, plague, very, very negative images. And yet now, look how this has transformed in all these years. So remember, there's still no vaccine against HIV and no cure, but the medication is getting so fantastic, it's meaning people are living like this, healthy and well, like in the past, they never were.